Proverbs chapter number 29 verse 21 and 18 18 where there is no vision you've got to have a goal in your life you got to set something that when you finish this your life something to be accomplished you just can't be jello in life you can't go wishy-washy Paul one of his life goals was set his mark to Jesus Christ and he finishes his life saying I have finished the fight I have fought a good fight I have set the course and I'm going to be faithful before the Lord Jesus Christ you gotta set yourself a career goal you gotta set yourself a family goal are you going to get married or are you going to remain uh, uh, single? What are you going to do for the Lord? What are you going to do for your church? What are you going to do for your person? Because if there's no vision, it says the people perish. I mean, there are people who have died, and the thing is, who cares? Their life was so what? All they did was occupy someone's space. They, they breathed in air and they ate food that should have been somebody else's. And Christians are like that. There are some Christians out there, okay, they got saved, but they don't do nothing. They didn't have the vision. They didn't seek the blessed hope. They didn't care. They're saved and so what about anybody else? And they'll die. For all have died. The wages of sin is death. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Again, we're in the Old Testament, but as far as the law for the Christian, it's a good thing to do. Not for salvation, but for your character. When you go back and read the law, okay, we don't bring animals to the temple. We don't sacrifice blood, but the, the blood of the precious lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you go look at all the other laws as reference to your neighbor, reference to people, your property, your crops. I mean, there's got to be a reason why the God who created all life said you're not to have a mixed vegetable garden. It's got to be a reason. Uh, there were reasons why you don't eat certain animals. Now we do. Paul says we can thank the Lord and we can bless the Lord. We can eat. Uh, hog. We can eat pig and swine. But for some, they can't. And when it says, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt, when, when you dig a hole in your yard, put something around to tell people, those are proper things. It excuses you from liability. And it gives you a character of doing right and looking out for, for your fellow man. And it looks at you to be honest. And when you do what God says, and people look at you doing what God says, even they don't know what God says, that will make you a godly just man. When you don't do it for a show. Those Pharisees and Sadducees in Jesus' time, man, they made up the law. They did this. They said, I mean, with the finger of the law, you do it. And they didn't do nothing. And the people followed Jesus because he, he showed compassion. He showed love. He showed forgiveness. What the religious people weren't doing. And he kept the law. 100%. And his vision was the Calvary. And he went all the way. And he didn't perish. He's living right now at the right hand of God. And the Bible calls it, he is our example. Jesus told us to take our cross. Do you know what taking your cross means? Do you know the Bible says all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? Do you realize what the cost is? to be to be a Christian 
And do you set your eyes on Jesus and not others? When you set your eyes on others, you'll perish. You'll quit. You'll give up. But when you set your eye on the law of the word, and the word is Jesus, happy you will be. A servant will not be corrected by words. Servant Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. You tell him something. He's not going to listen. That's what the verse says. A servant will not be corrected by words. You're not doing this right. You need to do it this way. Well, if a servant won't listen... To you correcting him, he can only be one kind of servant. Rebellious. Self-thinking that he is able to do. Able to perform that which someone else is just meddling. For though he understand, it's hard to explain this verse. I've seen the commentaries. I've seen what they, they try to say. But though he understand, it's not that he's, he's, he's shut his ears to the correction. He understands what he's being told. And he will not answer. The verse to me leaves it as, okay, here's how you're to do it. Okay, I understand, but... He doesn't do it and he doesn't give an answer to what he's going to do. He just may keep on going the same way he's going to do. And that's as far as I can explain that verse. He that delicately bringeth up his servant. Well, there's a servant. And we talked about children. He that delicately brings up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at length. Would you take a servant that will not listen to you? Will you take a, a servant that will not give you an answer? In verse 20, see thou a man that is hasty in his words. He's going to answer you before you get. So we have in verse 19, we have a servant. Verse 21, we have a servant. We have a servant that will not do what you tell him to do correctly. And he will not give you an answer. In verse 20, here's a man, even before you finish the sentence, he's got an answer. There is more hope of a fool than him. Now, this is not somebody you're having a conversation, you're trying to, you know, butt in or trying to, you know, step in and maybe give your t whatever. It is. This is somebody. Well, I've got a problem with my wife. And, oh, you know, oh, you know, with women, you know, you got to handle women. And oh, you know, my my child did it. Hey, you got to understand with children. Let me tell you about. They don't even hear what the problem is. Verse 19, he understands. Verse 20, he's not even going to give you a chance to explain it. I can assume, this is me assuming that, all right, this is, this is how you operate this piece of machine. Hey, I'm going to do it my way, okay? You just shut up. You're not going to say it like that, but I'll do it my way. Verse 19, a servant will not be corrected by words. But though he understand, he will not answer. Here's this piece of machinery. Let me show you how it's to be used. And the servant does it. And the person getting instructions walks off with the, with the machinery being used. Verse 20. 
Here's this machinery. Here's how it's... I'm going to do it my own way. The guy with instructions walks off and here's the machine. Bang! Uh-oh. Verse 21, he that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. He takes that, that, that servant as a child and he shows him and he explains to him what he wants, how he wants it done. Everything in particular, that, that servant grows up as a child and knows everything of what is expected of him. I mean, I don't understand. I'm using, this is the thing that came to my illustration, but the fork's fork belong on the right hand of the plate. If this guy wants it on the left hand side of his plate, the servant will put it on the left hand side. Not because it's wrong or right, because that's what he has been taught to do. Now, doesn't the Bible tell us that we must be born again? And there are some servants of the Christian. They'll be corrected by the word of God, but they won't say nothing. They won't give an answer. And then there are some who will just shut the Bible and say, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to come up with programs, and I'm going to come up with puppet shows. I'm going to come up with, you know, wine coolers, and how many goldfish we can eat, and the, the pop the balloon if it's got the blue ribbon. And if you say five verses, we'll give you a red ribbon. And after five red ribbons, we'll give you eight gold ribbons. And upon ten silver ribbons, we'll get you a Bible that you already have a Bible from learning memory verses. What is that? That's not what God said. And these churches today, that what's playing around and what's going on, you don't see God saying it in the Bible. And yet they got, what would Jesus do? He wouldn't do what you're doing. He wouldn't cancel church during the summer so you can go to the beach. Paul would keep on preaching the midnight. And if you fell asleep and, and dropped dead, that's where the expression came from, he's going to go down and check you out and come back and start preaching some more. And yet, if you, since you're born again, since the day you got saved, you nuzzle yourself in the Father. We call him Abba Father. And we seek to know what, what God the Father expects from us. And you get under what God expects and what not you would expect. All that relationship that God would call you a son. For you know what he wants from you. And if there's anything else in those verses, I guess it's open. An angry man stirs up strife. Troubles, problems. Whatever gets him angry, he's going to cause up a problem. He's going to make his anger known. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. To that context. In other words, the Bible doesn't say, don't get angry. The Bible says, you're not going to have a good 365 days at your job. Or 52 weeks. You're going to go through 52 weeks of your job and it's not you're not going to get angry. You're going to have 52 weeks of, of red lights. It's not going to let you not going to be angry. But here's an angry man. He gets angry and he causes fighting and problems. He doesn't meddle down. See, angry is not a sin. It's what you do with your anger becomes a sin. Jesus got angry. When he made that cord with the ropes and all that and went through the temple, you better believe with him. You think he was angry when, when he spoke those those, those fairies, you, uh, you you vipers and you snakes and you serpents. You think he was happy? Jesus got angry. You know, if you were to read the Bible way is written. Moses got angry. 
And you can tell by the context. And there are things when when, you, when we read the, the red letters of Christ, sometimes we just read it. We don't read it with the emotion. No, uh, not quoting anything, but Lord, will you call down fire like Elijah and burn up those cities? What are you guys talking about? How long have I been together with you? How, I, I can't believe you said that. I am peace and love, and you want me to call down fire because they wouldn't receive. How many other places? Listen, I was rejected of my own hometown. Turns to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You think he was highly locking and having a good old time? Peter, if you understood what I've been telling you these years, I'm going to the cross. For your benefit. To acclaim the, the victory over Satan and death. To one day get the title deed of the kingship of all eternity. Don't tell me not to go. A furious man aboundeth in transgression. Transgression is a sin. You better watch where your fury is. Because anger and fury will plant a seed of bitterness. And you don't want that seed. There's only, and I had this w once in my time, maybe twice, and uh, thank God I got rid of one of the times early. But when you plant that seed of bitterness, you take the most stubborn weed in the world. And I don't know what, what that is. But I have dwelt with weeds in gardens, flower boxes. If there's one thing I can grow, I can grow weeds. Tomatoes on their hand, I can't grow. I can grow the weeds. Maybe I should concentrate growing on weeds and maybe my tomato plants will come up. But there are some weeds out there, man. You pull those things, every single pull of, it, of that root. You yank that sucker out of there. You come back two days later and that thing is up there smiling. It's like, ah, I'm back. And you rip that thing out of there. I have, and I mean, I get a recipe for I have poured gasoline on certain weeds back in Connecticut, I swear. I have come back the next day. The next day. That thing swiveled up and died. I didn't come back the next day, and that weed is back. That is like a bamboo that we had up in Connecticut. You, you couldn't get rid of that stuff. What I'm trying to say is, that's what the bitterness seed will produce. The most annoying weed that you can know about where you live in your part of the world. And you can yank it out. It will come back. He said, you've gotten rid of your weed of, of bitterness. Uh, is it gone? No, it comes back. Every once in a while. When I least expect it. More. you got to be careful. Because usually that comes around of self-righteousness, envy. That's just not a bush that you want. That is not the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And then there are times where we'll let our dog outside and she'll come in. She's got all these little green things over her. That's a weed. And it attaches it to the dog's fur to be scattered around other places, wherever that animal goes. Your bitterness, your fury, your anger may go onto someone else's pant leg and grow in their garden. And the funny thing about it is, I don't know when I realized this, but. When we were kids, you take dandelions when they turn white, and you sit there, you blow, and all those things just go everywhere. It's fun. 
Until one day you're old enough and you got your own property, you got your long and there's the dandelions, you realize, you know what? You're reaping what you sow. Every time you blew the, you, that white was seeds. You blew the seeds all over the place. It looked pretty. Until when you blow it, all the seeds are gone. It's like, oh, good, it's gone. And you go look in your lawn, you go look at your neighbor's lawn, you go look across the street's lawn. Now there's more dandelions. You just spread it out to your lawn and other people's lawn. And it, beauty, it made it look good to you, but it's not. Poison ivy, the leaves look pretty. You don't want to touch them. And Solomon, through 29 chapters, has given us warnings about envy, anger. Wrath. It's troubling. It destroys. It's a canker. And you know what? With envy and with strife and, and bitterness, you know, they can go in and cut out a cancer spot in your body. And 15 years later, do tests on that spot or your body and drop. And hey, it's gone. It's eliminated. And you do want you sit down, and think about someone's name, think about the, the person, or, or you mention a part of your Bible or whatever brings that little light of that bitterness that happened a long time ago. And you, it's back. I know. And I give God and thank God for the glory. It's a, it's a flickering. It's not growing. Well, every once in a while, it will pop back up. you got to be careful. Solomon, the Holy Spirit, warns us to be careful. And look what shows up next. A man's pride. You didn't get what somebody else got. Nobody honored you. How dare he get that position? A man's pride shall bring him low. Matthew 23, 12. Proverbs 15, 33. 18, 12. Isaiah 66, 2. Daniel 4, 30. Luke 14, 11, Luke 18, 14, Acts 12, 23, James 4, 6, and 10, 1 Peter 5, 5. There is warnings against pride. Pride is never an attribute of God. It should never be in a Christian. Pride is a sin. Pride is what Lucifer had. Well, why is all, all the angels and all the seraphims and all that was before the throne. Why are they worshiping him when I'm sitting up here? I'm involved in the music program. I deserve the rest. I need. I. 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 And that's exactly the center point of the word pride. I. You know why America's going to fall? Because she's got pride. She's always had pride. You know what one of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was? Or sodomy? No, it was pride and abundance of bread and, you know, entertainment. And I believe that's in Ezekiel. Shall bring him low. America will be brought down low. It's not a man with pride. It's an entire nation. We've got rights. Really? What if America became a third world nation overnight? 
Huh? Would you like to, like the missionary said last night, would you like to be very uncomfortable to be lined up with a bunch of porta potties with just a little tinfoil of plastic wrap around there with the mosquitoes? We've got a right to sewer systems. Really, you do? Uh, how would, uh, I should take my family to Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., New York City, or Boston, or Missouri. And right in the middle of the, of the riots, stand up and start preaching the gospel. We heard a missionary that when a woman was getting beat up, he just stood right there and preached the gospel. Everybody stopped and started listening to the message. That's a nation that don't have rights. A nation that has rights says, God, get out of here. You have to have reserve tanks of water where he was. Because the water will be shut off certain times. Well, I got rights to have water all the time. Electricity. Pride. And you're going to be brought low. And what God's going to do to America, I have no idea. But it says it will be brought low. The day of reckoning will come to America. When? I don't know. But it's begun. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Pride is never spoken of as holy or right. But honor. That's somebody giving you. Brother, I just want to thank you for going knocking on doors. Brother, I want to thank you for passing out gospel tracts. Brother, I just want to thank you for you know studying your Bible and being faithful. Sister, I want to thank you for being a, a great husband to your, I mean, yeah, great wife to your husband. Pastor, we love you. That's honor. Mom, Dad, I, I just want to say I love you very much. That's honor. And that will keep you humble in the spirit if you do it right. Don't you do anything to receive honor of men, Jesus said. Don't go out and do something just so people will look at you and praise you. That's pride. You will be brought low. You know the Bible says that none of the religious people saw the resurrected Jesus? But they had to stand in their court and listen to Peter and James proclaim that he is, a, he is risen. They never saw the risen Jesus. Their pride missed out. The, the little girl that was dead. Jesus goes in there and says, she's sleeping. They start laughing him to scorn. They never saw, the story ends, they never saw the resurrected little girl. The mom and dad did. You know who's going to love to see Jesus at his second coming? Those that are humble. Those that are prideful are going to throw all their idols and hide in the caves and ask the mountains to fall on them. A prideful Christian will sing, Lord, wait a little longer. A humble Christian will, Lord, come. I believe I got it all settled. I believe I have witnessed the most. And everybody I've come to, I know I've sinned in areas like that. But, Lord, there's nothing better for, for you to come. One more day? Okay, Lord, let me do it for your honor and glory, but please come by the end of the day. A man of pride will answer before the whole thing is heard. See, a man that's hasty in his work, he's so prideful that, hey, 
I have all the answers. Right? A humble guy will, well, let me listen to you. Let me watch you. Let me try it with you watch and see if I do it right. Whoso is a partner with a thief, Proverbs 1, hateth his own soul. The eternal part of you in the Old Testament. The disgrace, the, the, the broken character you're going to get. Now, if you're a thief today, a Christian, you're not going to lose your soul. And you know what's sorry about today in America? You won't lose your character either. Matter of fact, if you're a thief in America today, you're going to fit right in. Matter of fact, they might put you on television so you can collect more money from, from innocent people. As you swing around your, your jacket and, and holy spirit this and holy spirit that. And the New Testament proclaims that he that steals, let him steal no more. I press that in the jail ministry. Don't do it. The Bible says go and get a job. There's a prayer we're coming, I think, the next chapter. About stealing. Relying on the Lord. You know what's going to happen in America? It's going to end up in stealing because you're not going to have the money to buy it. And Christians out there who proclaim to be Christians who have not put their trust in the Lord are going to go out there and steal. And forget God helping them. He heareth cursings and be raised it not. I heard someone last night curse Jesus' name and made me mad. I just, man, I shouldn't have blown it off. The person is a fool. So I use proper Bible sense. I'm not going to deal with a fool. But what about if you hear a brother curse in the Lord, a sister in the Lord? Pull them off to the side properly, nicely, prayerfully. Show them where they're wrong as a help. Don't stand in the street corner and have someone pass out and they come and then get right in their No, come on. They don't know any better. Be thankful they ain't uh, butchering Buddha's name. The only name they're going to butcher is the God of the Bible. Praise God to that. Without Jesus Christ's name being a curse, he wouldn't even be mentioned at the auto dealership or anywhere where cars and that are fixed. The fear of man bringeth a snare. You know why you won't do things? Because you fear man. This is why a man will not witness. This is why a man will not tell someone about Jesus Christ. He can come up with all the excuses. He fears man more than he fears God. So when you run back to Proverbs chapter 1, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. They don't know nothing because they don't fear the Lord. They fear man. But whoso put it, anybody, whoso put his trust in the Lord shall be saved. You know why it's not secure there? Because even though when you do fear the Lord and not man, there are going to be times when you're witnessing God will tell you to give someone a gospel track or to witness to him. You're going to have fear. It will show up. You're not going to witness to 100% of the people you meet. I guarantee you. 
There has been somebody in your life that you have sized up and back down. I have seen big biker dudes me back down. And I watch with one of my children. Can a guy just take his golf track and say thank you as sweet as he can? Kick myself in the butt and slam my head against the wall. By the way, the person you fear is not, that person is always going to have the adverse reaction of who you think he's going to have. And the one that you don't think is going to, to spit out nails and breathe out fire, that's the one going to do it. Many seek the ruler's favor. True. But every man's judgment comes from the Lord. You can't rely on man all the time. There are people, I don't know how many people in America are relying on the government to help them and not God. And they are in churches. And God will judge them. And the Bible says a man not uh, work, he ought not to eat. And you rely on the ruler and the government to, to take care of your food. What do you think God's going to judge you at? Now listen, if you can't make it, and you need aid, okay. You're working and you, you're not making enough because your employers are greedy with the capitalistic system of America, how great it is, E-I-E-I-O. You just lost your job and you're, I mean, you're searching, you're, you're, you're going out there, you're banging the, the pavement, okay, get help. But you know what I'm talking about. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. Really? Some of the friends I see Christians hang out with? Really? John 15, 19, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. If they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, if they not even have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, what does it say for you? It says an abomination. That's your family, that's your neighbor, that's your co-worker. You pray for their souls, but you know what? Look up the references in abomination in the Bible and look up the dictionary word for that one. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the judge. You're going to be judged. Again, I have seen Sunday afternoon family reunions destroy young Christians. I'll give you their names when I'm not going to. They go to church, but they're washed up. They ain't doing nothing for the Lord today. They don't hang around with those that are right. Matter of fact, they think those that are right like me. Uh, they're the ones who will tell you, don't say nothing, don't make no comments, don't don't get involved. Don't want to hear it. Don't you tell me about the true meaning of Christmas. Don't tell me about Merry Christmas. With me and my family, we're going to celebrate. Yeah. As Jesus Christ will probably tell most of them that you know, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Even Jesus Christ won't have anything to do with them. You will. You know, Christians stuck together more like what they should as a family. 
the church would be a lot better. You know, back when the church would shut down alcohol places, get people to turn and, and turn and, and get away from their sin and, and help and build up the families again. Back when if you miss church, you get a phone call from a concerned, worried Christian that makes sure everything's okay. Now you could probably have somebody who, who attends a church, a member of the church and all that, this this, this fall out all of a sudden. Who would be the first ones to call upon to, to find out that they have died in their house? Pastor, Christian friend, the people sat in the pew in front of you, the people sat in the pew behind you, the people sat in the pew to the left or the right of you, or would you just, just be kind of falling away? Or would the unjust be the first ones to find you? And he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. As you are, as the unjust is an abomination to you, the wicked should treat you like an abomination. They will not want you as part of their company. You will be when they make out the invitations. Do I really need to invite that family? When they get together, do you know what what your son, your your sister, your father, or whoever? You know what they've been saying about the Bible and all that. I hear something about yeah, yeah, your your. Somebody, whoever it is in the van, goes knocking on people's doors and bar he must be a Jehovah Witness. Hey, well, he's a fruitcake of cultists. Well, how come this how come those people were invited? Because they don't drink and, and, and you know, there's just something about those people. We don't want them. They're just a killjoy. One of the jobs I had, it, I used to have, as soon as I walk in a the room, they'll start apologizing what they were talking about. But what's it bothering me? Because they knew who I was, they knew how I stood. And I know they did not want my company there. And I didn't want their company. And all my job, listen, you may not want me to talk, but I know you're going to fear because somewhere, wherever the reference is, you're going to find a gospel track that I leave behind. Somewhere, uh, I'm going to leave the, the word of God behind for you to read or tear up or whatever you do with it. They don't want that. When the rapture happens, are, are there going to be the wicked? Are they going to, to rejoice when you're gone? By the way, the wicked there, the Antichrist. Anybody who lives or tries to live for God is going to be an abomination to, to him. And he'll take care of you quickly. He'll just take your head off your shoulders. I know how to stop you from, from spreading the word of God. I'll just take your head right off your shoulders. They don't love you. They don't care about you. Because they don't know what love is, for God is love. And they're not saved. They're not of God. They're not in the family of God. 
That's just a plain, simple, biblical fact. They're not going to know love until they know that Jesus Christ as their Savior and died and suffered and bled for them. Other than that, they're just Christ rejectors and going against God with small G-O-D-S, whatever it is for them. So it is. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away, Jesus said. That's the final ground. The words. 